Can anybody identify that plant? Mm -mm. It's a little bit blurry. That's actually uh, spotted knapweed. It's one that a lot of producers have troubles with. I've been nurturing and trying to keep that plant alive on my farm. And everybody's trying to get rid of it. So what is the role of diversity? What can diversity do for your farm? One of the big things with diversity, it gives you resilience. And resilience makes you successful. And I don't know if you can see me standing there. I'm standing in that field about dead center underneath the D. The diversity on our farm, and we're going to look at the diversity, but we're starting to plant flowers, pollinators, to attract different things. We have uh, 200 bluebird houses out for tree swallows and bluebirds. Trees, a pair of tree swallows will eat four to 5,000 flies a day. So try and uh, attract as many birds and uh, wild animals as you possibly can. This here is just a mix that we come up with of a number of years ago, I guess it was 2009 that we come up with this. Everybody likes mixes, but this here is a, a native pasture mix and there's 13 species in it and I used to get all hung up on mixes and this, that, and, and when it boils down at the end of the day is diversity. Um, my cover crops anymore, if I'm, if I'm planting cover crops, diversity. It's, it's all that really matters. This is the plants that we have identified on our farm so far. We've identified 178, and we still have a lot more uh, plants that we haven't identified yet. What's the great thing of having 178 plants, different plants? They're all eaten by the livestock. Every one of them. And that includes some of the most toxic. Uh, we have water hemlock. The cows eat it. The sheep eat it. It's supposed to be one of the most toxic plants uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, but there's a lot of toxic plants on here, or known as toxic plants. Um, I've been slammed by Penn State University for grazing horse nettle. I should be out there spraying it. So one way to look at your uh, toxic plants, if you take a bottle of medicine, you take one pill, it's medicine. If you take the whole bottle, it's poison. So if they're diluted in their rations, it typically isn't a problem. Um, and sometimes, you know, there's, if we've taken uh, forage samples of a lot of these. Uh, one com that comes to mind, here, here's a, a video from Peru. On my Facebook, if you, I have a Facebook group, it's called Adaptive Grazing Management. I think we're approaching 5,000 members. Um, and this is one of the gentlemen that's on that group. Um, and I invite everybody to come to that group. And there's no dumb questions. If anybody gets mean, nasty, or whatever, we just kick them out. We don't mess with them. This is in a, a tropical area. And it's, it's pretty neat to watch his videos. I've turned the volume off because you can't, un, at least I can't understand what he's saying, but it's, it's neat to see how they're doing it in different areas. The cattle are completely different as well. He rotates once a day. Native perennial forages. Why do you want native perennial forages? Chris had talked about uh, adding a lot of amendments to the soils and bringing stuff up. We've kind of swayed towards the native plants. Why the native plants? Because they're adapted to our soils. We don't have to necessarily bring all the uh, pH, you know, like Deer tongue. I really like deer tongue. It can be very productive, but it grows really well in a pH of 4.2. And whenever I moved to my one farm, we had some fields that the pH was 3.7. There was petrified corn stalks on it. And they were 
that corn was planted six years prior to me purchasing that farm. That's native uh, blue stem. And uh, I was talking to somebody earlier about the portability of reels. It's my daughter and my son when they're really little. But, you know, they can pick those little light reels up. You can have multiple ones. That's the only reels we use is the smaller ones. And we only use those plastic step-ins because we need the multiple wires for the sheep. Or we would go to a different type of fence post. This here particular field is that native mix that I showed you earlier. This here would be the first graze that we went across it. This here would be the second graze that we went across it. And then here's the third graze on that field. Any idea what that field would have yielded for three grazes? And we actually physically went out and took clippings and dried and weighed and about nine and a half tons of total dry matter yield but with no lime and no fertilizer ever in, on that field. That's just an example of plants that are adapted to our environment. But nine and a half tons is a lot more than what this web soil survey says that I can produce on my farm. Web soil survey says under very well managed uh, agriculture, I can produce 6,000 pounds of dry matter yield. And that's with putting all the amendments on. So I'll take nine and a half tons any day. Weeds, are these really weeds? I don't think so. How about milkweed? We have to fence the milkweed out on our pasture fields where this happens to them. The cows will actually go in there and strip them leaves and chew the tops off, and then my poor monarch butterflies don't have no home anymore. So I try to fence as many of them out as possible. But um, one way, and I, I always, well, your cows eat that, but my cows won't eat it. So my cows weren't like that forever. They just weren't cows. I have cows that eat bull thistles. The way we do that is we put them in a high stock density situation for a short period of time. And what it is, is those animals become competitive for those plants. So if uh, Terry doesn't get it, Dave does. Vice versa. I mean, there's, there's a competitive nature for the animals to eat particular weeds. So after they start eating these so-called weeds, they just come second nature. You don't have to put them in a high stock density. And we're not starving these animals to make them eat these plants either. They uh, voluntarily go in and they'll eat those plants. Here's a video a friend sent to me. That's field bind, bind weed. His cows actually would go in and tea eat the field bindweed before they would eat anything else. So if we look at the forage samples, we had a, I've had an opportunity to, to take hundreds if not thousands of forage samples. New England Aster, that was a pretty, pretty flower that I had listed with the weed slide. New England Aster, September 16th, 2016 when we took it. Crude protein, 24.5% crude protein. And that's not just picking leaves and flowers off. That is stripping all the leaves and taking half the stem because that's what the livestock would eat. How about grass leaf goldenrod, 19.1% crude protein. Sallow, sh sallow shed sedge, 17.1%. Now, sedge is one of the things that I've found with sedges, and I think it's part of the palatability problems, is sedges have the tendency to be high in nitrates. So be careful if you're grazing 100% sedges. Um, and then deer tongue, you've heard me talk about deer tongue, 24% crude protein. And then velvet grass. Anybody know what the velvet grass is? It's 
It's light blue and it's got, it's real soft, 32.8% crude protein. That's some hot forage air. Here's the deer tongue. Grow in soils, 3.8. Uh, we have a lot of strip mines up our way. I don't know if there's any, any surface strip mines mine down this way. But if you go on those strip mines, they take coal out from, they'll take and strip the surface down to about 140 feet what the coal seam is. It's, they're taking a vein of coal about 12 inches thick. And whenever you come in, they put it back. They put it back the best they can, but it's not perfect by any means. There's a lot of clay and stones and all kinds of things. But as I go on farms, a lot of farmers are purchasing, purchasing that land because you can get it for cheap. You can get that land for 500 to 1,000 bucks an acre. And I go on and do consulting work, and deer tongue is three times the size of any other plant. And they plant vetch, well, they don't plant vetch anymore because that's considered a, a noxious weed in the state of Pennsylvania, I believe. But they used to plant vetch, uh, bird's foot trefoil, and orchard grass. That's what they used to put on them strip mines. And this plant here would outgrow all of it. And that mule right there, she absolutely loves it. If you're driving her in the woods and she sees a patch of deer tongue, she's going to stop and try and eat it. New England aster, 5.1. One of the interesting things we found with asters is it's high in magnesium. The cup plant, or that yellow flower that I was standing in, that's cup plant, it's high in calcium. So these pl plants are high in micronutrients that our livestock need. How about Canadian thistle? Anybody have Canadian thistle? Nobody? I'm the only one? Okay, there's two. <laughs> Here's the cows eating Canadian thistle. You say, well, if you're spreading lots of weeds around the farm. You're letting that, or lots of seed around the farm. I'm not worried about that little bit of seed because it's already in my seed bank. How'd it start growing? So this is what it looks like after we get done. And this is actually on the, not that particular graze, but it's the next graze, and you can see the grasses that started growing. What we do with Canadian thistle, because it has a tendency to grow in round bunches, about 30 to 50 feet round, and then nothing grows underneath. What we'll do is we'll put a fence around that clump, we'll pack the cows in there as tight as we can for 20 minutes. It sets the Canadian thistle back, and it allows the grasses to grow. Are we going to get rid of all the Canadian thistle? No, it's not going to happen. But we can set it back enough to where the grasses will start growing. We shoot for taller height on our grasses typically, especially through the dry period. Uh, we want more shading, which causes cooler soil. Deeper roots, and uh, everybody's talked about deep roots here. One thing that hasn't been mentioned, with those deep, fibrous roots, we need to look at those as geotextile fabric as well. They will help keep your livestock up out of the mud if you have those large, fibrous roots. Here's 14-foot uh, tall corn. It looks like a mess. But grazing corn, the first thing that happens, you go in, the cows will eat the ears, they come back through, eat all the leaves, and then they eat half the stalk. That's the order after they knock all the corn down. It takes about 15, 20 minutes, they'll go through, they'll knock every stalk down. There's a comparison, that's a full-size cow to, to the corn. That's open pollinated corn, it's probably some of the tallest the ears set on that was eight to nine feet tall. This here is sorghum sedan grass, forage sorghum. There's a lot of different things in it, but that's the primary mix. Uh, we typically like to leave it grow a little bit longer so we get more biomass.
put onto the soil surface. If you remember right in the beginning, soil comes first. That's how I, and all this biomass that we tramp down will be gone in 30 to 40 days and even quicker. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. And this here's uh, where we run our corn down. Uh, Todd didn't mention you need to leave the, enough distance to where they don't mock the corn down on top of the, the fence or there's a good chance that you're going to be rounding cows up in the field. And trust me, it's not fun trying to round a herd of cows up in a 14-foot tall cornfield. Here's going into a cornfield. I mean, they just they tear into it. That looked like a windy day there. Here's big blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass. In this picture, how do we tell if that cow, these cows are getting enough energy? We've got happy lines. You can see this cow here down on the bottom. She's got uh, happy lines on her. And the way we tell if they got happy lines is if it looks like somebody took their fingers and raked the hair backwards on their ribs. And what those are are fat deposits underneath the skin. That's how you tell that those animals are getting enough energy. And with our native grasses, we still run it down. We have to, or we're going to have cows out. And there's actually 90 cows in that stand of big blue stem there. Increased organic matter, you have better gas exchange. Food for the soil biology, that's a big key. Better aggregation, better aeration, and more water holding capacity. In our native warm season grass fields, we've done water infiltration rates, and we've done many of them, and I've had two or three different scientists there. And we're showing uh, water infiltration up to 60 inches an hour in our native warm season grasses. Now the uh, cool seasons are not nearly as good. They're about 15 to 18 inches per hour. But um, if you look at this picture, this is pictures right after we grazed that. And one of the things that we found whenever we're grazing, especially if we're um, on a high stock density, you can see that plating on the top layer of that soil. About the top two to three inches of soil we get compaction from the animals. And that compaction actually comes out relatively quickly with our earthworms. They start opening uh, those pores up. And whenever that's compacted like that, and it's raining out, we, get, we create mud. So one of the best things that we can do is whenever we have a rain event, as soon as it stops raining, go move the the cows or the sheep. And whenever you do that, the soil's dry already. I don't even look at the weather hardly anymore. Uh, used to be we'd get a quarter inch of rain, we'd be headed for a sacrifice area or some place that the, the livestock can be. I really, I, seriously, I don't look at the weather. I used to, I don't need to worry about it. We can stay out there. The increased diversity is going to uh, let us uh, feed more diverse biology, more energy flow, and predator insects or predator animals. Uh, just here last week, we have some in-ground quick connects in the middle of our field. And I pulled the cap off the hook into there, and I kind of got off taken. And the whole bottom of that pipe is filled full of gardener snakes. I'm not as scared of snakes, but it did kind of throw me off a little bit because actually one of them struck at me. Okay? But 
would you think in a patcher based system there would be all those snakes? Typically you would not find them in a grazing system. But they, had, they didn't come from the woods or into this, they had to have been localized. Some of the disadvantages of what we're doing, um, fence, I've debunked that one. Fence doesn't have to be difficult. Watering points. Water is the biggest challenge on every farm. Todd talked about it, Greg talked about it. I have a whole different take on it. Uh, labor, you know, I, I work an hour and a half a day for, with my cows versus working 16 to 18 hours and I can spend my time working on other enterprises on the farm. And wasted grass. We did have to change the genetics of the livestock. We don't, that cow herd is not the same today as what it was in 2008. It's not the same, same cow herd. Uh, my black Angus go primar primarily back to the old time Y blood from the early to late 60s. Uh, the uh, Maryland Y, uh, yeah, the Y College in Maryland has their uh, uh, herd of cattle and been had a herd of cattle for a really long time for those that didn't know. You know, I haven't failed, I just found 10,000 ways it wouldn't work. Okay, you've been down that road. If it doesn't work the first time, don't say that won't work, throw your hands in the air and walk away. You need to change a little bit, change something and try again. Some of the things that we have on the farm is our windbreaks. I talked briefly about that this morning. The windbreaks have been able to make us keep the manure out where it needs to be, manure distribution. If uh, we take them, if we were to take those animals back to trees, our manure is going back to the trees and we don't want that to happen. And this here's where the, eight, the 800,000 pounds to the acre, this is where we went through and did all the flagging and still didn't have enough flags. Deep live roots, another thing with those deep live roots, you're able to access nutrients you typically would not be able to access. You know, if you're having a drought and you have your roots, you graze your plants down and your roots are died back to that depth, there's a good chance it's gonna take a while for those plants to start regrowing. But if we have roots down 30, 40, even some, some cases like alfalfa, it's been They've followed the roots down to 40 feet deep. Uh, they're able to access water and nutrients that you typically wouldn't have. And geotextile fabric and energy for your micro herd. I know in the uh, colleges with your soil samples, you know, you're only testing the top four inches, but what's below you know, what kind of nutrients are below down four feet or whatever, or how long the root systems are. Uh, take for instance, cup plant. Uh, the cup plant, if you dig, dig a test hole and go down four feet, the roots are still there. And I worked with uh, Ernst Conservation Seeds and they dug a, uh, a basement and they f traced those roots down 10 feet and they still did not get to the bottom of them. You know, what kind of nutrients are those plants accessing? And cup plants known for being high in calcium, 3.47% calcium. Geotextile fabric. What geo geotextile fabric is, is say your land a road, building a, a lane, building a logging road. It's a fabric you put underneath the stone. And whenever you put that underneath the stone, it holds that stone in place so it doesn't continue to, typically if you didn't have this geotextile fabric, the stone would just keep going. It just seems like it goes forever. Put more stone on, it keeps going. No, 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 no. Uh, 
we're, we're pretending here. We're pretending our roots are, are geotextile fabric. There's some roots of depth of 36 inches. And that is some of the clay land. Um, Todd wishes he had some flat land. I do wish I had some hilly land because we're, we have a lot of, every, almost every field we have has a wet area in it. And some of those wet areas, one of the things that we're going to do this year, maybe I shouldn't tell you guys because you'll run me out of here, but I'm going to plant some cattails in those. Cattails are high in energy for the hogs. But what I contribute those roots being able to go down that far is the night crawlers. Night crawlers work vertical in the, cis, in the soil. Uh, Earthworms work horizontally. And whenever a night crawler creates one of those tunnels, they say it, uh, those tunnels will be active for 15 to, up to 15 to 20 years. We're seeing a lot of this on the farm underneath the, uh, with the microbe activity and the earthworms and everything that's happening. There's just so much life and it's teeming with life. Our topsoil's mixing with our subsoil. It's just modeled, you know, 18 inches below our topsoil, we have this modeling. So that actually is letting our roots go down through and accessing uh, nutrients that they typically wouldn't. So part of diversification is to bridge some gaps. We have our cool season forages, typically it's spring flush, and then we have another flush in the fall. And it, normally it doesn't grow much during the summer. However, if you start and bump your, your uh, management up a little bit, you don't see so much of a, a, a valley throughout the summer. Our cool season grasses grow just about all year long. We have warm season perennials and annuals, one grazing cool season annuals, one grazing warm season annuals, and then we have stockpile. We have to rely on stockpile for whenever we don't have anything growing. Uh, depending on what ge geographic location you're in, uh, say you're up in Canada, the Canadians like to do what they call swath grazing. They'll cut all their hay and they'll blow it or rake it into a swath. For in the East Coast, it's not typically going to work very well because of our water. Corn, a lot of folks have this conception that the cows can't go through the snow to graze, and we've bunked that myth. But they like to grow corn because it sticks out of the snow and it's easier for the animals. Why don't we graze the corn while it's at peak, it's at peak uh, growth? or peak uh, nutritional, say, in August, whenever our cool season grasses are tapering down, and save our cool season grasses for the wintertime. Just an idea. I challenged uh, an agronomist to come to the farm, and he took soil samples, and he screwed that mess up. But he tells me, he says, there's 24,000, or I read this in the Penn State Agronomy Guide, there's 24,000 pounds of potassium to the acre on average in the state of Pennsylvania. So this agronomist, he comes to my farm, he's pulling samples, and he comes back to me, and you need to apply this, this, and this, and this, and I'm like, okay. But there's 24,000 pounds of potassium per acre. Why do I want to go buy potassium and apply 700, and I think it was 720 pounds to the acres, what he what wanted me to put down? He says, well, that potassium isn't available. Okay, so we're going to go buy fertilizer and put on so our plants can grow. Why don't we just work with nature and figure out how to release that potassium, and our microbes will happily do that for us, and we'll access the potassium that isn't ready, readily available. You know, uh, uh, up to 80% of our... Uh, Synthetic fertilizers is tied up in the water, and 
the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico is getting bigger every year. Um, so why would we want to contribute to that if we don't have to? Stockpiled forages, we talked a little bit about that this morning. Um, normally for snow, I know, I don't know if you guys are interested in this, but I'm going to tell you anyhow. Uh, what I look for in good stockpile, uh, Greg says likes fescue. I've changed my outlook on, I used, for me, it used to be fescue. I used to really, you know, that was the grass to stockpile. I'm really liking my orchard grass. And it's the newer varieties, uh, HLR is heavy leaf ratio, uh, is what the last of the orchard grass that I've planted. But once you graze it off the first graze, it will not come back to seed. It will make leaves, it just makes leaves. It don't make any stem. I've measured orchard grass stem or leaves 56 inches long. You just reach down in that sward and pick it up and it just, just falls out, it's just absolutely gorgeous. But whenever that sward, you know, we may have leaves 56 inches long, but it may only be about 10 to 14 inches tall on the ground. And it's all laying over, and we have our legumes or our higher quality weeds in amongst that. And whenever we get to our snow, the, that sward holds that snow up off of there, and that uh, the forbs and legumes that are trapped in underneath that orchard grass just kind of become like they've been put into a, a deep freeze and preserved. So we have that quality. We've tested uh, stockpile at 19% crude protein in March, in February. We've tested them. Now, one of the things with grazing winter stockpile that I've found, I prefer a two, twice a day move whenever we're uh, grazing stockpile most generally. Because what happens is, especially if you have a little bit of snow or if you have a little bit of surface water, uh, the, the cows become selective. They'll go around and they eat the best. And in the process, if there's a little bit of mud underfoot, and they tramp on that grass, they're not gonna eat it. And in, in the case of snow, they'll pack that down tight and then they cannot get access to those, those grasses. So I'll move them twice a day in the winter time. This here's, what, this here's a fescue pasture. Um, that's a grazing stick, it's 30, 32 inches tall, I think. Or it might be 36, I don't remember. But you can see the height of that grass. You can see that it is getting a little bit on the rough side. Uh, typically, I'll, if I want to stockpile late into the winter, the, the plants that are more mature, and more lignified, actually keep better than the plants that are not, or only been rested for 60 days. They're more tender, and as they go through the progression of winter, they start breaking down, and they're not as accessible to the livestock. Dry matter to the acre. Um, we've actually, these here are actual numbers that we've, we've uh, went out and clipped and weighed, so it's not a guess. Uh, field F6, that's one that we've uh, winter stockpiled quite a bit. We're trying to get away from that field because we need to move our, our areas that we winter stockpile around the farm. We don't want them in the same area all the time. You can see there's some there over 6,000 pounds and, and as little as uh, 445 to, I guess, 4,600 pounds. And you can see the post graze. So we utilized on that F8, our post graze was 2,800 pounds. So they actually utilized uh, 3,400 pounds, and whenever we're winter grazing, we try to graze a little bit more than we typically would. Um, the plants aren't actively grown. We need to be careful we don't get into those reserves, because like uh, orchard grass, two inches above the soil, we have reserves. Uh, 
big blue stem, six inches. So we want to be careful we don't get into those reserves because we are going to set it back for the springtime whenever the grasses start growing. There's some crude protein. It fluctuates anywhere from eight pounds or 8% 8 crude protein, clear up to 19% crude protein. Gestational cows, gestational sheep, 7% crude protein is good enough. They don't need rocket fuel in order to stay. Now, if you're finishing animals, they do need dairy quality hay, but gestational animals, they do not need dairy quality feed. I talked to somebody about this this morning, uh, 3D fencing. We 3D fenced our farm, keep the deer off. My farm, if you notice this morning, is completely surrounded by woods. It's a giant food plot. And we literally had thousands or hundreds of deer coming in on the farm. And you think the PETA people were bad? Try dealing with some sportsmen. Tell them you don't want the deer on your farm. You'll have some flat tires in a real quick hurry. I had 17 of them in about two weeks. But anyhow, we get the deer off the farm. We put this 3D fencing in so it's not a, uh, uh, an evasive way and the sportsmen can still keep their deer is it's an extra fence. We have our, our perimeter fence and then we go out three feet from the perimeter fence and we put a single hot wire 30 inches off the ground. And the way it works is uh, deer are prey animals and this works with elk and moose as well. Deer see two dimensional because their eyes are on the side of their head. So they do not know how, what the distance is on that fence and they come up to that fence, and I've seen them, they come up to that fence, they hesitate, they get shocked, and they go. Is it 100%? It's not 100%, but this is a way of reducing the number of, of deer. Uh, there was that, that particular field there, we grazed it, uh, we put that in about four or five years ago, but we grazed that in the spring, and I, I would go back, I walked the farm every Sunday, and I go back and look, it looked like it was overgrazed. It wasn't growing, it was overgrazed, overgrazed. And then I figured out, well, yeah, it's overgrazed, the deer are coming in and eating it all. 36 inches out, 30 inches down. And this can be used in gardens. I have friends that use it in gardens. Uh, I have a gentleman, a friend up the road, he, his farm is one big food plot. He plants all kinds of things. However, he rotationally grazes his food plots. Okay, what happens if anybody's in here planted food plots, typically the deer come in and eat everything off when it's this tall and there's not really any, uh, they don't really get anything. So he uses 3D fencing on his food plots. He rotationally grazes his white-tailed deer. I, I think it's kind of funny. But here's a deer that challenged my fence. And I brought with me a, just a, a 3 8 rebar with a fin tube insulator tied on the top. If you look at that, I've used that now 100% of the time. I quit using screw-on insulators because if, if you've used any of the screw-on insulators, what happens when a deer hits them? You lose about five or six uh, screw-on insulators and your fence is down. Those do not come off the post once they're on there. The posts bend before they pop off. An inexpensive fence, uh, you can build fence relatively inexpensively if you put your mind to it. Here's my mineral feeder. Doesn't have to be anything special. It's just the top off of a 55 gallon drum with two, two handles on it. And then if you have a bull that likes to try and crawl in the mineral feeder, you put a hot wire around the outside of it. We had a bull last year, he just, he he'd try and crawl in that mineral feeder and so we'd make it hot. But that's the extent of our mineral feeder. It's uh, portable, it's easy to move, pick it up, carry it, do whatever with it. Um, I don't care for the other mineral feeders because you gotta hook them onto a side-by-side -side or something and drag them to the next paddock. And in doing that multiple times a day, it becomes very, very time consuming. One of the things that I'm known for is teeny tiny tanks. 
That tank there is a mortar mixing tub. I believe it's a 15 gallon. Um, how many animal units do you think that that will water? I've successfully watered 120 animal units in that. So we don't need a great big huge tank. And the way this makes this successful is we keep it within two to 300 feet of them at all times. If we make them travel, we need tire tanks or great big tanks. Because if you watch them, whenever, if, if the whole herd comes to a water tank to drink and they have to travel uh, a good distance, half the, the herd will drink and the other half don't get to what the water requirements they need. You know, half the herd will drink, go away, and then uh, from the peer pressure, the other ones will move away. This here is the valve that I designed and built. I have it back there, you can see it. I sell it on my website, but I don't care if I sell you one. I have a YouTube video that shows you how to build that and where to source the parts for it. Uh, Greg Judy bought two from me, and he's had done several videos on it now on how well he likes it. And we have people in Saskatchewan, Canada that is successfully using this, and it's been tested to 35 below zero now. And I had a gentleman, he emailed me here not too long ago, and he was, you could tell in his email, he was really excited. He had to keep emptying his garden hose and uh, whatnot, whatever. It took him a long time at night to empty his garden hose. So he bought one of those valves, and. Uh, he turned it on and he put it on 160 foot hose at 10 degrees, it didn't freeze. And I've shipped a ton of them to Tennessee too. So they're down here, the guys down in Tennessee here are using them. That's my preferred stock tank. 55 gallon drum cut in half, four handles on it, and just pick it up and go. It's pretty simple. I keep water in with the cows and the sheep at all times, and we keep the water moving with the livestock. And the reason being for that is, is nutrient cycling. We've got to keep those nutrients out where they need to be to be more productive. And this here is our winter setup. We just pop a couple pieces of foam insulation on that tank, and we're good, to, we're good down to 30 below zero. I'm, used to be I used to put a, a tank on top of it and put snow around it because I was all worried, but that's all you need. You're good to 35 below zero. There it is again, portable windbreaks. I talked about that. Okay, here's one of the examples of what I was trying to explain earlier. Seven, 11 inches of snow. If we pull that snow back, we have about five inches of grass underneath that snow. And that's from whenever it folded over and you can see the nice green, that's actually fescue there. And then whenever the cows are done grazing that day, you can see that there has not been any snow left on turn. Uh, typically, I like to have ice on top of the stockpile. And the reason being for that is the cows can actually break chunks out. I've seen them move four, four foot round chunks. Cows are huge, they're very powerful animals. They'll slide that out. And this here doesn't really show it too well, but they push windrows of snow up underneath the temporary fencing. And then there's our, at the end of the day, that's what we're looking for for manure distribution. And then in the springtime, that manure's there. It's accessible for those plants as soon as they start waking up. Uh, they start growing. Now that's June 2nd, but if you look at that picture, there's actually alfalfa mixed into that canary grass. It's almost five feet tall. Alfalfa, I've never seen alfalfa that tall before. You're gonna extend the grazing season, reduce soil erosion, increase soil structure, water holding capacity, building Organic material, why would you want more organic material? Greg talked about it um, as far as nitrogen. I believe it was Greg or was it Chris? Somebody mentioned it this morning. But if we increase that organic material one point, 
that's equivalent or close to the equivalent of one inch of rainfall that we're able to trap. So we can hold a, up to a 27,000 extra gallons of water. Weed control, we don't have no weeds since we're grazing everything. Um, break parasite and insects cycles. We never warmed our sheep. We've never warmed our sheep. We, never, we don't warm our cattle. Um, we don't have a parasite problem within uh, animals now. We, in the cattle, sometimes we have winter lice, but however, we haven't had winter lice the last couple of years, and I, I don't know why, because um, I've never done, really done anything to control it. But, um, and our insects, the, the, the amount of different species of birds that are on the farm, I should probably be cataloging that as well. We have the savannah sparrow. That's considered a very rare sparrow for our area. And then a cattle egret show up, and you look at it on the map, and it's not even supposed to be where it is. Um, it's pretty neat to see that. You know, and bottom line, it's higher financial gain. You know, that's what it's about at the end of the day for a farmer. You want to try and make a profit. You know, if the livestock had the opportunity, they would rather be out there than be tied up in a barn someplace. And there's my contact information. Questions? We didn't get a chance. We had, a, had that drill this morning, and I've seen a lot of hands up. Um, is there any questions that I can answer? Everybody forgot their questions. Greg. Um, I don't have a problem with it. Uh, I'm not sure that I would want to have the equine eat a lot of it because it's got hairs underneath the leaves. I'm afraid that the equine would get slobbers from it like they do from white clover. Um, but if we go into, we have some of it scattered throughout our farm, and if we go into a pasture field, that's usually the first thing that they'll, they'll eat is the deer tongue. Um, you know, I've never weighed it. I wouldn't say that it's like the cup plant and going to make 9,000 pounds. To be fair on the, on the deer tongue, I would say maybe 4,000 pounds. If, if that was 100% deer tongue, maybe 4,000 pounds to the acre. It's not like super high quality, but if we mix that in with some other plants, it, it would be great to put in. Yes, ma'am. Uh, sometimes, some annuals, like crabgrass is an annual, if I'm correct. Crabgrass is an annual. It reseeds itself every year. Goosegrass is an annual. Um, there's a lot of annuals, but like corn, sorghum sedan grass, stuff like that, yes, it has to be planted every year. And I'm getting away from that. I sold my drill. So, um, you know, we have come to that point that we're not using as much seed as we used to. Any other questions? Yes, sir. When you turn the cattle into a large stand like corn, yep. have you done any studies or seen any data about the percent uh, that they consume? Yes, we've actually done that research through Penn State. And typically in a cornfield, we'll, on average, we've done like three different, we've clipped and weighed before and after. Um, the Penn State girl that was doing the clipping and the weighing afterwards, she didn't like the after effect because there's so much manure scattered across the farm. However, it's about, we consume about 63% on average of the corn that's standing there, which is... That's because you a high density. Right, right. And we don't want to take everything. You know, typically a cornfield, say we had... Uh, if we took a corn field and chopped it for silage, there's a lot of bare ground. And with the soil life, you got to have something on top of that soil because your uh, microbe activity is going to burn that up just quicker and quick. By spring, those corn stalks are almost 100% gone. Yep, yep. Any other questions? 
we have one, well, actually we have two herds of cattle. We have our group of bulls, which that's my son's responsibility, and then we have everything else. And they're all together, yep, yep. Um, you know, if I had to run just cows and then a group of heifers and then a group of steers and then whatever, it's just too much, it, it would become overwhelming and too time consuming. And our sheep are actually, I know Greg does multi-species grazing in one paddock. Our sheep, with the higher stock density that we have, our sheep won't stay in the fence with the cows, and the cows won't let the sheep in with the fence. And, and that's partly my fault because we haven't bonded them, but however, our paddocks are so small, the cows like to bump the sheep out. So we keep the sheep separate. Um, we don't necessarily follow the cows with the sheep like a lot of folks. The sheep are where they need to be, and the cows are where they need to be. Yes, sir? Yes, yes, we, we uh, the border collies, we usually only have one litter a year. I don't want to be a puppy mill, but we usually have one litter a year. Usually it's in the fall, um, and it was, it's Scout, my brown dog. You see him in the videos a lot, and then I have a black dog. She's almost solid black with a white dot page. She is, her breeding comes from uh, Scotland, and her lineage is all trial dogs and Paige is very very focused in that aspect pups pups yep sell them at eight weeks old and you know everybody wants a trained border collie but really a good border collie the only thing you need to do is have a come and a lie down and a stay that dog will knows everything else it needs to know. You can work on your wees and your come bys afterwards, but a good border collie, it knows what needs to be done. Um, Scout's dad, he was like a higher person or something, I don't know. He, he like had a sixth sense. If I leave a gate down, that dog would lay at that gate and bark at me until I put the gate up. That's how smart he was. He knew that that gate needed to be up. I moved the livestock. He already knew where he needed to be and what to do. I didn't have to give him any commands. So, yeah, a good dog doesn't, you only need three major, three major commands, and they need to know them. You know, you don't want to yell at them a dozen times to have them come to you or to lie down or stay, um, but those are the three basic commands. That's all they need, and if they're good dogs, they'll do the rest. Any other questions? Yeah, we've moved cattle up to 13 times in a day. Um, typically, not so much more uh, recently, but it was whenever we were trying to get this uh, structure back in our soil in. Um, it would be whenever we were having rainfall events, I was moving them to help reduce any type of pugging or mud in. And as the soil has improved, we don't have to necessarily go out and move them 13 times in a day because we're not seeing those impacts of pugging and stuff on the fields anymore. And to help you out with uh, pugging and, and stuff on a pasture field, your paddock shape has a lot to do with pugging. If we have a long, narrow paddock, that's what we need to control weeds. We don't clip anything on the farm. There is instances where you probably should clip, um, but if we have long, narrow paddocks, there's more foot traffic and the cows or sheep, whatever, will tramp that down. And if we have a wet, or a wet period where there's a lot of rainfall and the soils start getting kind of mushy, square your paddocks up, make them square. There's less foot traffic whenever the animals are out there grazing. And a square paddock will give you more pasture utilization too. Yes, sir? Are, are your paddocks permanent? No. No, I have, I, I lost track, I think, at 43 paddocks with all my interior fence, and then we split those down into smaller paddocks. 
In the spring of the year, we may cover two acres a day. And then as uh, forage production increases, we may cover uh, less than a quarter of an acre a day. So we need the flexibility to make our paddocks larger and smaller. Yes, typically we put the paddocks up every day. Now, if I'm going to be, I know I'm going to be busy or something, I'll go through and I'll set, you know, maybe two or three days worth of paddocks up. And then the only thing I need to do is go move them, um, you know, if, if that's absolutely necessary. But, uh, yeah, we, we've set, I set paddocks almost every day. I like to keep one paddock set in front of them, and specifically if it's wet out. Whenever you start setting your paddock, at least my cows do this, as I'm working across the field, the cows will move with me. And then when I come back across the field, the cows come back with me. And before you know it, they got a cow path on the, along the wire. So it's a good idea to have that paddock set up. And cow, it must be a cow thing to ball whenever they see a side-by-side. -side. You know, it doesn't matter if they're full or what, they're going to stand up, they're going to come greet you, and they want new grass. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Russ. We appreciate yep. you. Thank you. Thank you.